this chapter 5, which I'm not going to cover completely, has several things. The first part is JDBC. This is the only part I'm going to be covering. It also has other embedded SQL. It has ODBC. Uh, it has more on SQL data types and schemas. It has stuff on functions and procedural constructs in SQL, including uh, the standard version of Oracle's PLSQL. It's called SQL Stored Procedures. Again, each database does its own way. You know, I told you about assertions, where the standards bodies jumped ahead. They were partly motivated by the procedural construction of SQL, where they were behind. Each database has implemented its own. And then they defined a standard which nobody implements, because databases have already had their standard way. People have already been, I mean, their own way, not standard, their own way. People have already been building applications using that. Now nobody wants to give that up and go do something else. Uh, so uh, each database has its own way. Uh, so what we do here is we cover the features, but the syntax depends totally on your database. We, we cover meaning in the book. I'm not covering it in this set of lectures. There's also stuff on triggers on OLAP. And last but one over there is advanced aggregation features. This is now increasingly supported by databases. Postgres supports a whole variety of new aggregation features. We looked at simple ones, group by aggregate function. There are a bunch of new features which include what are called windowed aggregates. For example, um, I want the, uh, I have data which is per day sales. I want to group by month or I want to group by week, but I may also want to group by consecutive periods of a few days to smooth out the data. This is called windowing. So uh, sales may go up and down each day, I, but I want to see if there's a trend across the month, so I smooth it out by, let's say, a four-day window. And then I see, is there a trend across the month? So I, such aggregates are supported. Then there's support for ranking. So supposing I have a list of marks obtained by students, teachers often need to get ranks for, give ranks to students. Right? How do you do that? It's conceptually very easy. You just sort, give first rank to the first mark, or if there are multiple people with the same mark, all of them get first rank, then go to the next value, give the next rank. You can do that easily. Procedurally, it's very, very easy to do this. But can you do it in a pure declarative language like SQL? Turns out it's not trivial. How do you define what is the rank of a person? I can easily say it imperatively. I can easily say sort it, assign ranks thus. It's a very small loop which anybody can code. But can I declaratively say, specify in SQL what is the rank of a particular person, of a mark? I, I've given a set of marks. How do I define what is the rank? Logically, not through a procedure. Maximum value will be the first rank. But what about second rank, third rank? What is the ith rank? Or given a mark, what is its rank? How do you define it? In a subquery, what do you compute? Yeah, so the simplest way to think about it is arrange the marks, but you are not allowed to do that. SQL, you can have order by, but that, that's only for output. Anyone else wants to? You have a ranking function, so that was added to SQL. It's now part of the standard. Uh, but if you didn't have it, turns out you can still do it. It's a very, very inefficient. If you think about it, the rank of a student is the number of students who have higher marks than this student plus one. If you take the student with the highest mark, nobody has a higher mark, so there are zero students with higher mark, so the rank is one. If two people get the first rank, what is the next rank? You could define it as either two or three. Let's keep the three one, with you have breaks in the ranking. That's often used. So then the next mark will have two people with higher marks, so the rank is three. So I can write a subquery to compute this, to compute how many people have higher marks. But it turns out it's horribly inefficient. If you think about it, for each student, I again go over the list of all marks, find how many got higher, count it, and output it. Very, very inefficient. You can easily write this query, but if you run it on a very large class, it's going to run pretty slowly. So the SQL standard was extended to provide a built-in way of generating ranks. 
So that's also part of the advanced aggregation features. So go read it up if you're interested. Uh, Postgres does support this, so you can try this out on Postgres later on. Okay, so now a very brief uh, overview on JDBC. Uh, so what is, uh, well, J ODBC is a father of JDBC in some sense. The goal of all of these systems is to provide an API where, which programmers can use to connect with the database server, send SQL queries over, get results back. And finally, one other thing, which is to get metadata, like what are the relations in this database, what are their attributes, what are the primary keys, what are the foreign keys. You can get such data about the schemas and so on, which is called metadata. So the JDBC API supports all of these, connecting, running queries, getting results back, getting metadata information. Um, so let me do it by example. So you'll be writing such queries in the lab uh, tomorrow, not today. Uh, you can, some of the syntax is a little weird. You may not fully understand what is going on, but I'll try to explain it. So the first thing over here, it says class dot for name Oracle JDBC driver Oracle drive. Actually, I should have updated it to PostgreSQL. Uh, your sample programs have the PostgreSQL variant of this. So what this is doing is, this is dynamically loading a library to talk to Oracle. Because the API is the same. Whether you talk to uh, Postgres or Oracle, the API is the same. But the actual code implementing it varies. In fact, the API even allows you to connect parallelly to two databases, one Oracle and one Postgres, and issue things to either. So where does the request go? If I say connect to a database, which one does it go to? Well, when you open the database, you specified which one, and correspondingly, it will go to that one. So you are allowed to actually load multiple libraries, which are all supporting JDBC for different databases. So the first one is loading the, dynamically loading the Oracle uh, JDBC library. And then it, let's say driver manager get connection, JDBC Oracle thin. This is a clue to the driver manager to say, use the Oracle implementation of JDBC library. If I say here, PostgreSQL, or what, uh, it, it, the exact syntax is uh, on the Moodle site, then it knows it should use the PostgreSQL library. So the driver manager chooses the right one and returns a connection. Then the connection itself is what you use to do the actual work. So how do you do actual work? First, you get a statement from the connection. The statement is essentially a way of attaching a SQL query and executing. Now, the actual work is in the next slide. But before that, let me also show you how to wrap up after this. So when you're done, you have to close the statement, close the connection. And if there's an exception, well, uh, the syntax in Java is try catch. So it, here, anywhere here, you may get an SQL exception. And it catches it and then prints the exception and says what went wrong. In fact, to be safe, it should also close the statement and connection here. Why should you close statements, and in particular, why should you close connections? If you will not close the connection, then there will be uh, lots of connection in the pool. And in that case, server will throw an error to many connections. Correct. Exactly right. So if those of you who are familiar with Java are used to garbage collection in Java, right? If you, if you use C, C++, you know when you dynamically allocate, you have to free. In Java, you are used to never freeing because the Java environment automatically collects unused memory. Unfortunately, it cannot collect unused connections because it's not part of the same framework. And if you don't close the connection, what happens is a lot of connections are open to the database. Now, when you test your program by running it once or twice, you don't notice anything. This happened to us many times in early days, in the early 2000s when we uh, first switched from our old systems to uh, JDBC web front end for student registration. We would test it out, everything would seem to run fine. Then we say, okay, students, now go ahead and register. And in the first hour, a few hundred students would register. The first few would go through fine. After that, nobody can get in. What happened? There a lot of open connections. The database ran out of the number of connections it supported. No new connections could be made to the database. So the following uh, 
queries could not be executed at all. And we didn't have any clue what was happening. So remember, so very early days, uh, around 2000. So we, this happened one semester. We fixed it. The next semester, it happened again because it turned out somebody wrote some new program, uh, new features, and again, they forgot to close connection. Eventually, the programmers realized that this was very important and did it right. But occasionally, in some new applications, some programmer forgets to close connections, and this problem recurs periodically. It's not ever gone away fully, unfortunately. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. You should close connections when you're done. You should never leave it open. And in particular, if you get an exception, you might end up not closing it. So you have to close it here also. Okay, so much for connections. What do you do with the connection? Uh, here is an example. Um, it's again in the try catch. You got the statement, so this will come here. So this part, do actual work, is where this stuff will be put in. So this is saying statement.execute update insert into instructor value. So this is a SQL query directly. Okay, so if there's an exception, you say what happened. So that is for an update. This one is for fetching results. So here, statement.execute query, select department name average salary, blah, blah. And the result of that is a result set. Why result set? Because there may be many rows in the result. So it's viewed as a set. Uh, so result set is a standard JDBC type. And then on the result set, while result set dot next, what do you do? Um, system dot out dot print line, result set dot R set dot get string department plus space plus get float two, which is this one. Why two? Because this doesn't have a name. The column name for average salary is not there. We don't know what the column name is. We could have given a name here and then used it here. Or if we don't give a name here, we use it by position. Why get float? Because average is a floating point type when it's mapped to Java. And here is a string. I know the column name is department, so I say department. I could have said uh, get string one. That would also work. And there's a loop. How, how many times does this loop? As long as r set dot next succeeds. That is, the first time it's called, it returns the first row. Each time it's called, it returns a new row. Eventually, when there are no more rows, this fails, and then the loop exits. So this is the basic way of interacting. OK, so that's the very core thing in uh, connecting to a database. Um, then there are other, so th these are some, th this data I already told you. And then there's some other way to deal with nulls. It turns out Java does not know anything about nulls. So how do you know if I, I said get string, how do I know if the string was null, if the name was null? For strings, it's not a problem. It can return a null value. But if I say get float, how do I know if that was a null value? The SQL database supports null, but Java float does not have a value corresponding to null. So I can look at it afterwards, I can say, int a equal to rs dot get int a, and you can say if rs dot was null, the previous operation, if it was null, then this int a got some value, I'm going to ignore it. I don't know what the value is, it may be zero, it may be minus max int, it's implementation defined, uh, so I should, instead of using it, I can say it's got null value. Now the last thing I'm uh, eating a few minutes into your break time, uh, but let me wrap this part of JDBC with this. Um, which is prepared statement. What is a prepared statement? So many times, you need to take a parameter from the users. And I'll uh, go over this later on when we talk about web interfaces. But the bottom line is, I want to execute something. So I take an input from a user, a role number or something from the user, and then execute a query using that role number. So I have to pass user input to the query. Now, the simplest way of doing it, and a very, very insecure, dangerous way of doing it, is to take the string which the user has given and use the standard Java string concatenation to create a query. You should never, ever, ever do this. Why? How many of you have heard of SQL injection, SQL injection? Unfortunately, very few of you. 
I want every one of you to be careful about this. This is something you should teach your students because this is a huge risk which many people are going out in the mar job market without knowing how dangerous this is. So what is the danger? I'll come to it later on, when I, uh, a bit later. But the bottom line is, if I get values from somewhere, so here it's um, like ID and so on. Here, insert into instructor values, uh, ID, name, department name, balance, and I've got these from the user. So the first problem is just a syntax error, but that turns into a security hole eventually. So what if the name which was typed in was D'Souza? An error will come. Why? Because I have put quotes. So D'Souza would have, you know, I, there are, it's, it's hard to read from this, but there are quotes added around the string, single quotes added around the string. So I added single quote, D'Souza was a particular one here. So single quote D, single quote, Souza, single quotes. It's not matching. The first quote closed the string. Now what is Souza? It thinks it's part of the SQL query, not a string, and tries to interpret it and gives a syntax error. Now, this may sound innocuous, say, okay, this is a bug, and the right way to do it, deal with this bug is to use prepared statements. So in this case, what I'll do is uh, use this thing here. Um, instead of a, a, the previous way, which was execute query, connection dot create statement, instead of this, I do connection dot prepare statement. And I give a string without, I, 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 you know, the, the values which I'm getting from the user are represented by question marks here. And then I provide the values through this. I can say this is a variable, piece stmt is the prepared statement. So I say set string one to something, set string two to something else, and so forth. And then I can say execute update. What is this going to do? It's going to fill in the values and execute it. Now what if I did a set string here, instead of Perry, I said D'Souza with the single quote in it. The prepared statement will take care of that. It will take care, it, it finds that there is a single quote there and it escapes it. Okay, it will put a backslash single quote or something like that. So that, that is handled properly. You don't have to worry about strings containing quotes. So this is the correct way of doing it. You should always use prepared statement if you are taking values from users. You should never directly do execute query. You should, any value which comes from a user should be represented by a question mark here, and that value should never be concatenated. It should only be set using set string here, or set int, whatever it is. So what is the security risk? The previous was just a syntax error. The security risk is um, supposing the user, so the query is select star from instructor where name equal to some name. I'm taking a name. So supposing the user, instead of ins uh, giving a name, says, x quote or quote y quote equal to quote y, no close quote there. That close quote would be added uh, here. This, this one adds the close quote. So what is the SQL which gets executed? Name equal to x or y equal to y. y equal to y is true. So it's going to print all names instead of one name. Okay. So what's the big deal? You, what the big deal is the user managed to get the system to execute a different query from what the programmer intended. The programmer intended this, the user got it to execute something else. Now you can leverage this. Um, now, user could have put x quote semicolon update instructor set salary equal to salary plus 10,000 semicolon minus minus is to comment out whatever else, uh, to comment out this quote would get commented out there. So now what has happened? JDBC, uh, the, the string which has gone to the database is now two queries. The first one is uh, select where, uh, star from instructor where name equals x. The second query updates instructor set salary. Now, shouldn't JDBC complain that you gave two SQL statements instead of one? And again, for historical reasons, people have been using JDBC with multiple statements, not banned. And guess what happens? Both get executed. So the programmer never intended to allow the user to update salaries. This, this is not proper. You should not uh, be allowed to update your own salary. But hey, you just did. Okay? 
So there's a huge security hole. Now, we can assume that instructors are honest people. They're not going to go around doing such things. But there are many hackers in the world. And it's quite surprising, but banks of all people who should be extremely security conscious, many banks and credit card companies never realized that SQL injection is dangerous. And many of their programs had SQL injection problems. And hackers have actually exploited it to make a lot of money off these people. Okay, so it's a huge risk. Now, what about other places? If banks have not been careful, what about others? They haven't been careful. I can assure you, even today, IIT's own, uh, IIT Bombay's own applications developed internally. There are quite a few SQL injection bugs. Now, why? You know, I've been telling people for at least six or seven years now, more actually, to never ever code like this. Turns out somebody or the other built some bad API long ago, and in order to fix it, they have to rewrite a lot of code. And there are always new feature demands, and nobody ever gets around to fixing the security holes until one day somebody will hack in and cause havoc on our system, and then they'll wake up and go fix it. That's how the world works. That's how Microsoft went around fixing a lot of bugs when it came to a point where people stopped buying Microsoft products because they were extremely uh, vulnerable to viruses. Then they did a lot of work to clean up their act. Uh, it's a lot, lot better than it used to be. Uh, but still, there are problems. Now, similarly with SQL injection, there are a lot of problems. People are cleaning up their act. But at least new students who we graduate should never, ever make this mistake. So when you teach this, please emphasize that students should never make this mistake. It's very easy to do. There are some tools for recognizing and detecting this. But it should just go into the head that they should never even write code like this in the first place. OK, I'll stop there.